Oh, Griffin is there. Good, yeah, Griffin is here. Yeah, hey, Griffin. Barbara. Um, Chris is here. Chris is a friend of my mom. And right. um, yeah, so welcome, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Um, you came in muted. I'm going to ask that you stay muted until we get to the Q&A portion, but you will have an opportunity at the end to ask questions. And um, we also have a handful of questions that were submitted on the registration form. So thank you if you submitted that. Um, let's see. And um, we also have my dear friend, Sean, she's in here and she is going to be moderating for us. So when we get to the Q&A part, you can either use the raise hand thing or type it in the chat, however you want to do that. And she will make sure that that, that gets um, in and we'll get that to Laura as well. So uh, without further ado, I would love to welcome Laura Kalpakian to our uh, Zoom today. Laura, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm so excited to do this with you. Um, and for, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that most of you probably have a little bit of background on Laura, but just in case anybody doesn't, um, I'm just gonna touch briefly. Um, she has two new books that came out uh, this year. Uh, one is Memory to Memoir, which is a handbook on how to write memoirs. And in August, she also had her memoir published, which is called The Unruly Past. We're definitely gonna be talking about both of those today. Um, and that is kind of the bulk of what we're going to be talking about. Um, she, let's see, where did it go? She is also the author of 16 novels and four collections of short fiction um, and is published here in the United States and in the UK. Uh, she is the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction and was nominated in 2007 for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award. Um, I know you've spent a lot of time over in the UK and Ireland and um, that sounds like a whole Zoom session in and of itself that I would love to hear about. Uh, and then uh, her latest novel was The Great Pretenders that came out in 2019. And that one uh, is on our shelf in A Room of One Zone on, on Catherine's shelf. And so for those of you who don't know, Catherine Thomerson Bird is the founder of The Frugal Frigate. She opened the store in 1988. And we, uh, she gave me my first job when I was in high school. And now I am the fifth owner. And uh, when I opened up a room of one's own, which is an intersectional space, um, I asked Catherine if she would give me book recommendations maybe quarterly. And so uh, Laura's book, The Great Pretenders, is on that shelf. It is one of Catherine's favorites. Um, so Laura, I'm going to dive right in with a pretty broad question, but I'm sure you're going to narrow it down for us. How did you get started in writing? Well, I got started in writing the way most writers do, which is reading. I mean, I was always a really, I mean, I, I still remember the, the first time like it clicked for me that I learned to read. It was just so liberating. And so even as a small child, I just loved to read all the time. And I remember, and I just, I also thought, oh, it must be so wonderful like to, to hold in your hand a book that, you had taken like something that you saw in your head and, and hold it in your hand, an actual artifact. And so when I was in the fourth grade, I remember asking my teacher, Mr. McDonald, if he would illustrate my books for me. And he said, yes, he would. And at the same time, I asked my mother if she would type my books for me. And she said, yes, she would. Now, Mr. McDonald never illustrated anything I ever wrote but for like 25 years my mother god bless her typed my manuscripts and uh she she was an artist at that particular keyboard and then later she entered them into a computer and I didn't start using the computer um really until like the late 90s or so so I came to it very late because I had her skills you know so anyway, I've always, I always wanted to be a writer and, uh, and I just sort of read my way through it. And so finally, though, I wanted to be a writer, but I never quite had the courage to write beyond when I was 13. And I wrote a novel about the French Revolution, of which I knew nothing, by the way. So, um, but when I came back to California, and it's, I chronicle this in 
the unruly past uh, after having lived back east for about five years. That was when I decided it was like, okay, you have, you have to do this. This isn't going to just happen for you. You have to do this. And that was when I really set myself to teaching myself how to write. Um, there was not, I had never heard of an MFA program at that point. I mean, I'd never even heard of it. So um, I was in grad school in literature, as I kind of tell in the opening of Memory into Memoir. And uh, I divvied up my life that, and I taught freshman composition there, which was great because that's, you're asking the writer's core question, what makes good writing? And I worked a retail job on the weekends and three days a week I went in to teach and take classes. And the other two days a week, I just donated to my own work. And I did that for years, about five years before I got my novel written and, and subsequently published. And after that, I just never looked back. You know, I had to do my passport and, and uh, I put on there novelist, da-da, you know. <laughs> so uh, that was that was sort of the wayward path that I took. Wonderful, wonderful. I know everybody probably has, uh, or not everyone, but I bet it's a, a similar story that we all start out as readers, or those that are writers start out as readers. I am not a writer. I am a, I'm uh -huh. a heavy reader, but I am not a writer. Um, uh, but uh, and you you taught. You said you mentioned freshman composition, uh, but you've also taught, uh, I believe, memoirs. For memoir and about fiction. 20 years? Memoirs and fiction. Yes, memoir and fiction, right. I taught both memoir and fiction for a long, long time. And I, you know, every year I revise these, the class, my materials and the exercises and that kind of thing. And I have a whole folder of stuff like that didn't work, you know, but the ones that did, I went on refining. And people, my friends and uh, students say, oh, Laura, you should... You should put this on, you should write this up in a book for people. And I just sort of never really did. And then about two years ago, I, I got word that um, University of New Mexico Press was looking to expand their repertoire of books about writing. And so I sent in a proposal. Um, I just kind of threw it together from my classes, you know. And they accepted the proposal. And I thought, I thought, oh, I can write this book in three months. But it did not happen that way. In fact, putting the class on the page was so very different than teaching it for a lot of reasons. One of them is that a class is an organic thing and there's all and, and its response. And you even the quietest person in that class is contributing something. You know, and also in my classes, I had always tried to create a sense of camaraderie, especially for memoir, because memoir requires a big dollop of trust amongst everybody who's in that class, because you're going to be learning about one another's, you know, the past. And in some ways, that's what makes for really close friendships is people who know your past. So. Without that, what I had to, I, I changed a lot of stuff around. And I also had to, um, I had to imbue this with what I think of as an invitational voice so that it wouldn't be dry and it wouldn't be like, oh, uh, you know, thou shalt, a bunch of thou shalt. It wasn't going to be like that, but that the, um, but that the reader or the writer could come to this and also hear, um, you know, my own voice in here as well. And, um, and, and I think that I achieved that in this book. And I also think from people who have read the book and people who've been in my classes and stuff that the exercises, each chapter has um, a lot of explanatory things. And then it, they, gives examples for like how this really works well and a couple of examples of like how it doesn't work so well and then there's always an exercise that goes with it so that the writer can use that and use what they've read 
and, and move forward. So I really see writing in general as a process of amalgamation, not that you dash off a draft and say, oh, that was fun and great and now I'll move on to the next thing, but that you constantly return to it and enrich it and, and expand and trim back too. I mean, that is my own writing process. Um, and I talk a lot about that in the chapter about, about revision. So um, all that was, was lovely. And I put my, for the examples, I had made up some student examples, but for the example of what works, I used my own novels and stories. I quoted from my own work. And um, one of the, that was one of the ways in which I touted the book to University of New Mexico Press. I said, there won't be any expensive permissions because I've got all the rights back on my work and I can do whatever I want with it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so that's all my work. And so the editor or somebody, somebody said to me like, well, but all you're quoting here from fiction and stories and novels, you're not quoting from memoirs. And um, I thoroughly believe that good writing is good writing, no matter what is the genre and, mm -hmm. and that fiction writers can learn from memoir writers and vice versa. I mean, good writing is good writing. You learn that in freshman comp, you know what I mean? So, but uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who actually runs the Paint Creek Press um, early in the spring. And I said, and, and she said, oh, you have memoirs, don't you? And I said, yeah, but they're all essays and they've been printed here and there. And, you know, I don't even know where I could find them again. And she said, oh, let's just bring them all together and we'll put them in a book and we'll publish the book. And I said, oh, that sounds, I bet I could do that in three months. <laughs> but that was, a, that was a real journey for me because I ended up having to go back to my own book and look at what I had done wrong. <laughs> and, and more than that, I mean, the, the memoir essays that I had in mind, I mean, most of them, some of them were really old, they, you know, they were still stale. Some of them were taken from speeches where I rambled here and there, and which that might work in a speech, but it, it's not good on the page. And finally, I just ended up with, I had to throw out basically everything and start all over again. And then I had the whole question, because these are memoir essays. It's not like Frank McCourt's, you know, I am born and up to 19 or so. These are memoir essays. And the biggest chunk of the book is about the two sides of my family, the Armenian side and the Mormon side. Mm -hmm. My father was Mormon. My mother, I took my mother's maiden name when I started to write. And uh, so I just, then I'm like, how am I going to put the book together? What's the best way to structure it? And so I really, even having written fiction all these years, I felt like this writing the unruly past was such a um, such an education for me, really, and it made me think about things and people and so on that have not nibbled at my brain in decades, you know. Um, but I also found that my own book was was really helpful to me because I'd read my drafts and I'd say, "Wait a minute." you've got stuff here that looks like, you know, you're, you're, you're promising the reader, like, oh, this is going to be really dramatic. And then it isn't. You know, what are you going to do about that? You know? So those are the two books. I, I marvel that I got them both out this year. I really do, you know? So, um, yeah, I worked really hard on both of them. But they, I, I, I wanted the unruly past, and you know, God bless my friend at Paint Creek. I mean, she brought this out, and she did the cover design. And I was everything. just gonna say, I love this cover so yeah. much. Um, I love what it evokes. I love the torn pages, like the torn maps. Yes, uh, yes. it's everything about this is wonderful. <laughs> yes, and she got the map 
It's a map of Turkey and the city mm -hmm. of Adana, which is where my family is from, is just above the one photograph. So yeah, so yeah, she yeah, did all I this. And I really yeah, wanted yeah. this book to come out uh, before Memory mm -hmm. to Memoir so that if anybody, you know, said, oh, well, she writes fiction. Why, why should I listen to her tell me how to write a memoir? Because they, oh, guess what? I have a memoir as well. So, um, but in the teaching, I mean, I love teaching fiction too, but um, I really love the memoir. I love what is genuine about it. I love the way in which it inevitably, you, even if you think I'm just going to go in there and write down, you know, my family did this, that, or the other, or I grew up here, or whatever. The more you write, the more you remember, the more it comes to you, the more you have to shape and form it. And I really do think that the process of turning raw amorphous memory into something with narrative shape, that is, that really makes you think, you know, re regard your past in a new and a fresh way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I must say too, that the other thing I really loved about the memoir classes was the fact that these really friendships came out of it, you know, people who were still allied to one another, you know, years later. So that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. I know those when you find your people and form bonds in ways, even if you have, I mean, everyone has different stories to tell, but um, you touch on that process. And I, I as I said, I am not a writer. I, I wrote a bit in college and, and high school and I, I used to write as a kid and then I stopped for some reason. And I'm not really sure why other than I'm, it just kind of came to me when you were saying that, like, maybe it's too painful. Like there are things that you have to look at. And when you have to put things under a microscope that can take its toll sometimes, depending on what we're talking about, you know? It, it can truly take its toll. I put up this just this morning a blog post about that toll that was for me, I think I had sent it to you in manuscript, the passports and visas. Yes. That, um, that uh, what I absolutely did not expect was that it would, the past would kind of peel back almost like an onion, you know, and that uh, as I'm writing all this, and, and, and I've published the book, and still, like, things are coming to me, like, whoosh, whoosh, why didn't you ever think of that, you know? Um, but, you know, people I haven't thought about in years, it trips mm -hmm. through my dreams now, and, and it's like having once done that, I keep thinking about it, and I keep going back, and so, like, when I write a novel, after the novel's been published, to me, I will never reread it. I will, I, I go back, I might glance at it, I might read a couple of chapters, but I never reread the whole book. To me, that's like a neighborhood that I have left. And I'm, I'm fond of the people in it, I'm interested in them, I even uh -huh. care about them, but I don't live there anymore. And that's just not true with memoir. I still live there. And yeah. also the other thing, writing fiction, you know, you were talking, um, Aaron, about pain and, and handling all that. When you move that onto a fictional character, you're able to siphon it off into somebody, something, some other form, some other person. And inevitably, as you write a novel, there's a point at which those characters develop a certain amount of autonomy and they basically tell you what they will do and won't do. You, 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 you don't get to boss them around anymore. And so, but the first person narrator of a memoir, you can't really do that. You can't just pop them in, turn it into a, a fictional character and then watch what that character is going to do. You still have to struggle with, you know, whatever, whatever's there. So I found the whole thing of writing <clears throat> a book of memoirs, not just individual memoirs that I published here and there, but a book of memoirs to be a really 
emotional and artistic and interesting experience. So yeah, I could, I can, I can. I, I'm, I'm imagining that, and as I said, not being a writer, it's all of a sudden like it's all these thoughts are swirling around in my head, and um. So I think you should you say, read my memory into memoir. Maybe make you want to write a book. I know. Oh, I, I am. This is actually my <laughs> copy that's here on my desk at home. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's, um, you said, you know, with, with fiction, I think, would you say it's a fair statement that with fiction, when you start to write something, you're always writing from a personal place, even if it's just at the very beginning, but then it takes on a life of its own and it can get farther and further away from you. But with memoir, you're just on every single page in every moment yeah. and yeah. you just can't, you know, and, and with fiction there, I, like I've read fiction and I'm like, this, this feels like something that the writer knows and it's very close to their heart and probably didn't require as much research as say another character or something like that but with with memoir um you know you are your only source and well that's not altogether true memoir also i think really requires to really make it rich i think it needs research and i think mm -hmm. and i have a bunch of suggestions in here about where to look and how to look and how to and basically how to build context around, uh, to build context around these events that a lot of times you won't have, you know, like. Um, like time frames, like time. And time frames. Or like, places. Um, I had a, the, my dad's best friend and who was his uh, best man at his wedding and, you know, friends forever. He. Uh, my dad's been gone about 10 years now and he his said he, he was he's been gone about five years anyway I wrote to his daughter about something when I was looking working on this and I said <clears throat> you know I want to know a little bit about Sid's family and she wrote back and she said well I think they did this or that but I don't know why, why did they leave New York and move to Los Angeles she didn't know so it's those kinds of things that you know, if you don't have somebody that you can ask, a lot of times you can kind of look it up or you can look at documents that can help. The other thing that's important about memoir is it's not, a, memoir requires imagination. Imagination has to finesse off what, what you don't really know. Imagine, mm -hmm. you need imagination it, to uh, knit in a way. Do you know what I'm saying? To bring like it all fill together. in the blanks if, if there's especially writing about childhood or something we our yes. memories of childhood are so pieced together and, and things that we remember and the way we perceive them you know that's where the research comes in on the right. time and places and things like that like what was going on in the world in politics what was going on culturally because what, at seven years old on, <laughs> what was going on with with um you know it what what was going on in the world can be really important. What moves people around? Um, the memoir that you just mentioned that your book club is going to read. I mean, how did that person, you can imagine how they came here, mm -hmm. this Laotian family, you know, and uh, that was the result of massive upheavals. The way that my family came here, the Armenians anyway, was a result of massive upheavals uh, right during and after World War I. Um, so those are things that you can fill in and you, you can really enrich your own experience or your own remembered experience mm -hmm. with that. So I have a whole chapter on research too. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, um... What kind of research did you have to do for the un unruly past? Like what, what blanks did you need to fill in or things did you need to flesh out on your own story? Well, for the unruly past, for the big, the, as I said, the really the first half of the book is about the uh, Armenians. I mean, one of the reasons I never wrote a memoir before this because people say, oh, you know, you tell such funny stories about your family, you should write a memoir. And I never did because I honestly... The two sides of this film, I could not bring them together on the page. They would not try as I might. I, I just could never make it work. And it still doesn't work because they have totally different chapters. Mm -hmm. Then the third chapter, 
sort of brings brings them together. But that chapter starts when I was about when I was just a kid. But I had done a lot of earlier research um, on both sides of the family, and and so I had that already done. I if I had had to do massive research for the unruly pet, I could not have. If I hadn't already got that done, I, I could not have done that in a matter of months. That I mean, I started the book I think in February, and I handed it to the publisher at the end of July, and by wow. the end of August it was printed. Yeah. So that was all fast, you know. Um, but one of the things that I used was that um, long ago I had this idea, this sort of about. Um, uh, about a girl in Liverpool, in working class girl in Liverpool in 1911, who is vain and shallow and, but she's literate and she has tremendous imagination. I don't know, she just came to me. So I started this story about this Mormon girl. And then I brought her over to this country, to America, and would have been about 1911, 1912, something like that. And I married her off to a guy named Gideon. And then once Gideon's mother came into the story, Ruth, Ruth is her name, she fought me for years. She just took it over, just took it over. And um, that book became These Latter Days, which has also been just uh, reprinted also by Paint Creek Press. Mm -hmm. And so I went, this is in the late 70s, I went with my mom and my dad to, as I knew I was going to write this book and I needed to know something more about these people. So I went my mom and my dad to um, Utah where a lot of them were living and those who were still living. I mean, my grandfather had died years before, but, um, and my dad, I needed to bring my dad because like, I hadn't seen these people or had any kind of contact or anything in years, at least 15 years. And uh, my dad was a very charming uh, guy. And anyway, we went there and he was warm and, and everyone loved him. And it was, uh, it was only there a few days, but these great aunts of his, uh, uh, great aunts of mine, they were his aunts. They were just wonderful and they were so generous with me. I was so um, touched really that they, they didn't know me. And, um, and I must say, I went before the first novel was published because if they had read that, they probably wouldn't have been as nice. But anyway, uh, so they told me all these stories and, I, and my mom went there also to take notes. And, uh, and so I use a lot of that. And with their stories, which were many of them preposterous, I went back and kind of winnowed through and all. But what really surprised me, I was raised Mormon. And certainly by the age of 17, I had declared to my father, I'm done with this. I'm never going to. And, but what informed my fiction for decades was the Mormons. It was, and the stories that they told, and I kept, you know, coming back to them. And so at first I published TLD. I, I worked on that for like seven years before I could publish it. And uh, not for want of trying, I want you to know, but, um, uh, but it was this germinal novel for me. And all these other stories came out of it. And here were all the Mormons that I thought, like, you know, I had disdained. And, and, but they just were this wonderful, fertile field of characters and situations. And also this town, which I called St. Elmo. So I grew up in and attended San Bernardino High School. And I can't tell you how happy I was to get out of San Bernardino. Uh, but St. Elmo became, San Bernardino became St. Elmo, and now it has its own past and its own, and I have to read back another book to make sure I don't say something wrong about where I have 
incidents or people um, appear and the history of the town and the history of all these. And so like all these characters and their relatives and their, you know, they have, they have woven through my fiction for, oh, probably 30, 20 to 30 years. I mean, they, I just keep coming back to them. So it was this wonderfully rich field. So when I went to write the Unruly Past, that, I, that was kind of what I did was I went through their stories, my aunt's, great aunt's stories, but I also had, many of you will know, the Mormons are very big on genealogy. And they had given my dad a bunch of material that ended up in my possession because I have a big house. <laughs> and so I was able to go through that, you know. So there were just a lot of things that wove in and out. And, you know, the present is always complicated, but the past is complicated too. Especially when you revisit it and dissect it the way you need to, to write a memoir. <laughs> Yeah, I would think, you know, it's um, I don't want to go so far as to say repressed memories and I'm not a psychologist. So but that's the term that's coming to mind. Like, as you're saying now, even after you publish The Unruly Past, there are still things swirling around in your head and things that yes. like, oh, why didn't I remember that and things that come back to you. And it's not that you forgot them for any reason, like it wasn't a, a repressed memory or anything like that, but just lives are compiled of a lot of things and a lot of people and feelings and, and places and points in time. And that's a lot to catalog in one brain. <laughs> well, for me, it wasn't so much what I didn't remember. For me, it was a question of perspective that having mm -hmm. written this out, written out this, whether you like it or not, when you write a memoir, you are, you must ask questions of the past. And what happens is that the answers to those questions change. Based the on, answers change. On just life experience? What, what is it that makes those answers change for? Because if you're asking questions of the past, you're looking at it and you come around from here and then you come around from here and you come around from here. And, you know, it, the past, um, I mean, it, it will look different to you at any given time in your life, even. You know, you look back at high school when you're in college and it, it, it looks like one way and then you get to be 50 and you go, oh, wait, that was, you know, oh, that was a happy time. But when you're in the middle of it, you know, you're, uh, and, and also your relationship, you, you, you as you ask questions of the past, your relationship to it deepens, it seems to me. And that you can see people either with more charity than you were willing to expend to them in real life, or like, oh, shit, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, uh, mm -hmm. it was, it will be, re it's revelatory. And so one of the things that I firmly believe is that the past always changes. The past is not like a sheeted plane with hospital corners, you know what I mean? The more you write in it and about it, the more you ask questions of it in some ways, the more you struggle with it, uh, it, it will change and your relationship to it will change. I don't know. Um, let's see, it's about 4.35. Um, are you okay if I get to some of the questions that were submitted? Sure, that would be fine. Okay. Uh, first one comes from Katya, and Katya asks, how do you negotiate your writing of the past with the people who are in it and who will read you? Uh, do you keep them as readers in mind? Do they interfere with the writing? And is there a cure for not letting them interfere and shape your writing? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, for me, the most of the people in the first two essays in Unruly Past are dead. I mean, my grandparents are gone, my father's gone, my mother, God bless her, still alive and kicking and doing very well. Um, but 
most of those people are gone. One of the things that I, I find is that um, you can edit through some of this. You can change names. I've changed names um, because there's just no point in somebody who was maybe a major figure, but a minor person, you know what I mean, in your mm -hmm. life. There's no point in, you don't need to use that, that name. Um, but when I'm writing, I, I don't think about, I don't think about that. I just try and get the draft on the paper. And then as I'm revising, I might go back through and call and shape. And one of the other things that I found in writing um, memory or writing the unruly past was in order to shape the memory or shape this into narratives that had, you know, rhythm and drama and so on. There was a whole bunch of stuff that I just, I had to cut out tons. I had to cut out just because it brought up more questions than it was ever going to answer or that I was prepared to answer. And those, I would put those in these other files and uh, and a lot of times I just spew words there, you know, it would just come to me. But is, it, is, is that going to be in these pages? No, because they bring up more questions than it's going to answer. In putting memory, straining it so that it makes memoir, you, you edit, you do. And if you have like, um, family members or something who are going to read the book. And I also have a, the last chapter here called Truth in, in Memory into Memoir is about this. You know, I would suggest not sharing it with them until you are really ready to part with it. That would be my thought. So maybe on the on sale date. <laughs> when yes, there's yes. no going back <laughs> yes but the last chapter in, in memory into memoir is just called truth and in my opinion both as a writer and as a teacher of memoir truth belongs to the teller it truly does okay um yeah that, that was a great question um i have uh two questions one from jane one from lynn and they kind of go together uh jane says how do you pull the pieces of your life together into a compelling read and Lynn says, uh, how do you decide what to include and what to leave out? So you kind of touched on that in the last one, but if you could expand on that. Sure. I mean, one of the things, like, there's all different kind of memoirs. I mean, there's memoirs like Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes. That the first book starts out, you know, he's a tiny little boy and he's 19. So, you know, there's all, and there's all kind of ways to write memoirs. And I talk a lot about that. For myself, the memoir essays that I then put into a certain kind of order, that was the way to go. And it is, there are long tracks of anyone's life that are dull, you know? And, and you do have to kind of elide over that, uh, unless you're Frank McCourt who can make it all compelling. I, I don't know quite how he did it, but anyway. Um, so I always suggest like people start with a notion of, a, of these es separate essays, you know what I mean? And just write each of those. So don't try and make a whole continuum of it because it can defeat you, you know, that you find yourself writing, well, da, 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 da. It was just, you know, no, just cut it off where it's dramatic, leave it and then start something else. And then as, as these pages accrue, as these chapters accrue, then you can start to put them together. And if you need to stitch along and, and connect, it's easier to do it when you've got chunks of separate material. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's easier to do it. So for me, the, the, for the unruly past, I, the question was how to arrange these essays. Mm -hmm. And so I started with the Armenians because they were the most difficult. They all have names that no one can pronounce. And then I went to the Mormons. And then I went to the chapter where, um, from when I was a, a kid, that led up to my D 
declaring I was done with the Mormons and then my publishing these latter days. And then I went sort of around after that. I mean, that was kind of the arc of that. And then I went to high school, silly things in high school that ended up being not so silly. And, um, and then on to when I was writing. And, and then I just had a other couple of little essays at the end that were very short, just small things I wanted to include. But um, yeah, I, I do think that if you, if you do them in discrete essays that you don't say to yourself, well, how am I gonna account for this, you know? As you create draft, the more draft you create, the more you write, the more those transitions will come to you. And I have to say, I do think a lot of the, some of the transitions in the unruly past, they're rickety, you know, they, they, they just are uh, as the book goes along. I think the first three essays, they have an arc. I see. So more writing vignettes of different things and then see yes, what, what stands out. Then, and then just, you know, come bring them together slowly. And the way to bring them together, it will come to you, honestly. It will come to you as you create more. Oh, this is related over here. This is related over here. The thing, another thing that was astonishing to me in writing The Unruly Past was I saw these connections in my life that I'd never thought about being connected. You know, mm -hmm. that um, like when I decided, and the reason I decided that my, my first wish was to be a journalist. I wanted to be a reporter. And when I gave up that ambition, when I look back at it, I see that it coincided with my meeting somebody who gave me another ambition that at the time I just thought, oh, these are, I, I didn't even see them as connected. But when you start to put it into a pattern, because that's what memoir does, it puts the past into a pattern. Oh, it's shocking, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of interesting too, but a lot of times it's shocking. Um, let's see. Uh, Griffin asks, uh, which book of your many has given you the most unexpected trouble or was the biggest challenge? Most unexpected trouble or what? Or biggest challenge. Well, there's two kinds of trouble. <laughs> there's a trouble getting it published, okay? That's, that's one. And then there's a the trouble writing. And I would say of the books that I have published, the one that gave me the most challenge was These Latter Days. I mean, my original manuscript on that book was 900 pages long. <laughs> it is a beefy book. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, it yeah. is a beefy I mean, book. <clears throat> yeah. So <laughs> I, that was a big challenge. And I worked on that for, you know, seven or eight years before I could really get it right. And of course, I thought I had it right long before that. The one that was the biggest challenge to get published um, was Caveat, which is also a story that is rooted in St. Elmo and, um, you know, rooted there in the Inland Empire, basically. And mm -hmm. uh, that was a book I got this idea in sort of 1980 from reading like a clipping in a newspaper and that I cut the clipping out and I carried it in my wallet till it disintegrated. And I didn't publish the book caveat until 1998. And even at that, it was with a small, a small press, but it was, um, I really wanted to tell the story. And first it was a story and then it was a novella. And then, I, I mean, I, I worked on it off and on for 15 years and I kept coming back to it. And each time I came back to it, I, I learned something new about it, but it was a, it's a little short novel. So it, it was, it was hard to publish. Uh, but I had met some, uh, when I published Graceland, 
I had met some Memphis friends who were writers who were also um, big Elvis fans. And they knew these, it was a North Carolina company. They said, oh, why don't you send it? We publish over here with this North Carolina company. And I, I didn't think North Carolina would be interested in a story about Southern California, but they did and they published it. And they actually also brought out TLD to go with it at the time because the woman said to me, were you indicating here that, that there's some kind of affair or something going on between Ruth Douglas and Lucius Tipton? Can you explain a little bit more about that? And I said, oh, they got their own 500 pages. <laughs> so they, they reprinted that too. So that those of the work that I have published, that's a good question, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And it actually leads to another question that Katie asked uh, when you were talking about the two kinds of trouble. Um, do you have any knowledge to share about the querying and publishing process or finding a good fit with a literary agent or a publisher? I have a chapter in here in Memory into Memoir called What Next? <laughs> and, and I do address that there. And I also there I have a I, I go on it from length between the difference between uh, a synopsis and what I call slap copy, which you would read on the inside slaps of a mm -hmm. hardcover. I talk about how to put together a query letter, how to seek out a publisher or an agent. I mean, that, that, can, that can be a full-time job right there mm -hmm. for as long as it lasts. <clears throat> and some other possibilities for uh, for publishing. I will say this about publishing has changed so much, certainly in the last 25 to 20 to 25 years that it's, when I first started publishing, my first book was published in 1978 and I had more in common with a book that would have been published in 1878 than with a book that was published in 2018. You see, in, in terms of mm -hmm. the publishing landscape, there's only like four of them now. Four yeah, big, the, the you know, big four. It used to be the big the five, big now it's the big four. <laughs> well, yeah, they were the big five, now they're the big four. But the other analogy that I like to use is this. I mean, these little indie presses like uh, Paint Creek that my friend in Wisconsin started, I mean, the difference between what they call you know self-publishing is was distribution. Mm -hmm. But even that has changed now. And so these little indie presses, you get somebody smart who knows how to do this, how to put the book together. You get somebody smart who knows how to do publicity, which we haven't figured that out yet. But uh and and they you can distribute, you can connect. And so the analogy that I always like to use is like I mad I picture these, the big four, the big five, uh, I picture them like these great big dinosaurs <laughs> that are unwieldy. And all these little indie, indie presses, they're like the little scurrying mammals. You know what I mean? Yep. <clears throat> and, and I really think that the little scurrying mammals are, uh, they've just opened up a whole, a whole new vista, you know, mm -hmm. and they reward authors. And I don't mean just keeping your royalties. Uh, you know, they have their own circuits and their own, and you can go and do and connect and find readers. And so Aaron, you say you're not a writer, you're a reader. Hey, well, writers need readers. We, we mm -hmm. love readers, you know? Yeah. So uh, I love yeah, small so press, that's, that's, small press that's books. That's kind of the thing that the I think about um, with these small presses, these little indie presses. I mean, it's it's not like it used to be, you know. Yeah. I mean, so. And then the last question that was submitted uh, through the form, and then we'll have a few minutes to open up in case there's any anyone that didn't get a chance to submit their question. Um, Susan says, how do I, a woman with few childhood memories, write a memoir? How do I, what is the rest of it? A woman with few childhood memories. 
Do you try write to a admit, memoir? Write a memoir. Well, a memoir can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about childhood. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be about childhood. I always feel that, like, even when I'm writing fiction, like, I like to know the backstory, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I like to know the backstory so it becomes the front story. But um, again, I think if you write, it, it is, you know, it is to uh, paraphrase Jane Austen, it is a truth universally <clears throat> uh, recognized that the more you write, the more it will come to you. You will remember stuff you didn't know you had forgotten. The more you write, the more it will come to you. And uh, yes, I mean, I, I just think that's true. And it was certainly true even as I was writing um, The Unruly Past. But the memoir can be about anything. I mean, one of my favorite memoirs <clears throat> is uh, Maxine Kingston, The Woman Warrior. And that's a series of discrete essays. And Maxine, the I, she doesn't actually, and, and living in Stockton or whatever, she didn't actually come into it until about two thirds of the way through the book. And her first episode, her first essay is about an ancestor who has been wiped off, wiped out from the face of the family and exploring that and exploring all these different things. So the memoir, it doesn't have to be like, you know, Ulysses S. Grant when he writes, starts out where he's born and so on, and up to, literally almost up until the day he died, he was writing that. It doesn't have to be like that. It's a much more malleable form than you might think. And again, at the back of the book, I have a list of all the books I refer to in there. So, and a lot of them are unique and, and uh, they're not like, they don't have to sit, fit into some kind of straight jacket, okay. childhood to adulthood or something. So maybe pick your strongest memory, memory and start writing and go from there? Yeah, I would just say, don't, don't straight jacket yourself into, oh, I must start with childhood. No, no. Start with where the past starts to speak to you. Start there and then move, you know, forward and or backward, you know. It's not linear. Uh, yeah, it, I, I really do. Um, I really do think that the, the, the memoir is, is a much more, I mean, we used to think of it like, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin's The Autobiography of Benjamin. Usually an autobiography will start with childhood and go to, you know, adulthood or whatever. But um, it, it, the memoir really is a much more malleable sort of genre. It can go here, it can go there. It can explore the, it can explore the past before that person was ever born. Uh, it can be One Summer, one of my other favorite memoirs <clears throat> is A River Runs Through It, which basically is the summer of 1937. And he's got other, some other material, but it's basically that one summer. That's all it is. And it leaves you slain, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Um, are there any questions uh, that you have? You know, if you didn't get a chance to submit, I'd say let's let's hear from someone that hasn't already submitted a question first, um, and and um, you can use the raise hand button or, um, you know, just unmute yourself. I think we've got yeah about five minutes, and then Laura's going to do a, a short reading for us to close it out. Raised hand. I think um, Helen has a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I, I just wanted to add on the fact that um, I'm not a writer, and but I've been inspired. And there's a, a time in my life that I'm going to write about someone else, and within that, 
um, uh, memory and the memoir and my life with this person, uh, it has brought out so much more information that I had even not, you know, maybe you don't have something to say, but you really, really do. And it just kind of explodes in, you know, in your mind and you can hardly type fast enough to get things on paper so that they can be formed. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, that's what I want to say. And I want to say also, you know, you, 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 you talk, talk about that. <clears throat> uh, the third person narrator can easily, um, you know, help uh, get the person's deepest thought to into another. I mean, just, just, it's just inspiring. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, full disclosure, Helen Johnson is my sister. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for the question, Helen. <laughs> it, is, it is. It's very true. It's just like I said, oh, I have nothing to say, but she goes, well, you really do. And here it is. And I'm going, oh my gosh, absolutely. So, so my family knows I'm a great nagger. And um, I mean, I nag my sister, obviously. <clears throat> my mother, and your mother. <laughs> my mother was, um, my dad died about 10 years ago and she had been his caretaker for years. And I mean, he, you know, when she finally got kind of her, some of her strength and energy back, I said, oh, you, you know, I, I teach memoir. You should write a memoir. No, no, I don't have anything to say. No, 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 no. Finally, I nagged her so bad. I said, <clears throat> okay, just start with your addresses. And that's one of the things, the exercises in here. And then she, so she started and on all these incidents and, you know, started accruing around them and on and on and on. And at a certain point, she found that these chapters were growing and, and the little addresses and were different. And so she came to the thing she wanted to write about her parents. And finally in 2017, she decided she was going to take this and she was going to really turn it into a real memoir. And she called it Centennial Memoir because her parents, my grandparents, were um, married in 1917. And then she had a little semicolon and she called it a tribute to my parents. And I talk a lot about her process writing when this, um, I mean, she was, she was in her 90s when she took this up. And, and I mean, I edited it for her and, you know, did all that, but, and I quote her in here too. So yes, it was, it was absolutely true that, um, and then once she decided, oh yeah, that little subtitle, a tribute to my parents, that became how she could structure the material, you know? And so when she was 97, we had a big publication party for her, you know? So, wow. Okay. Any other questions? Sure. I'd like. I'd like to add. I'd like to add a word of tremendous thanks. I am. I am Laura's cousin, <laughs> um, and to have. I just read the Unruly Past, which was so powerful and so beautifully written. And I want to add a huge word of thanks. I wish, like anything, I so wish that my mother were still alive. She died five years ago. This is what she always wanted you to write. She was always, always hoping that you would write that Kalpakian family story. And here it is, and it's beautiful, and it's so well done. And so oh, I'd, almost, I'd almost like to say on her behalf, I'd like to thank you. But, <laughs> but it's so, it was so enlightening to... Uh, not only I wasn't surprised how well you wrote that because that's how you write. I'm one of your I'm one of your biggest fans and readers. Um, but what I'm wondering is whether your mother, this you did all this just within this past year, has she been able to read that and appreciate that? Because much as I want, I wish my mother could. I'm so hoping that, that your mom can. Has she been able to at all? Or have you shared with you know, her the process? <clears throat> my right, give, give a little background here. <clears throat> it's been a very hard year for us. My, my brother died in January. Five days later, my mother had a heart attack. And she's now living in a nursing home. And uh, so I've been going round and round all that, as, as well as, you know, and everything else. And... <clears throat> uh, 
and she knew that I was going to dedicate memory into memoir to her. And I told her that, and I even gave it to her in big print when it was that kind of thing. Um, and I, I gave her memory into memoir. She can't really read. And so like, when I go to visit her, I go, I say, Oh, you know, would, would you like me to read to you about the part that she's in? You know what I mean? And that's what I do. I haven't, given her the unruly past kid, I think she's forgotten that I was going to publish it. And I know that she can't read it and that it would frustrate her. And, you know, so the answer to your question generally is no, she doesn't. She knew I was going to publish it, but she's forgotten. Her cognition has slipped a lot. She's going to be a hundred in March. And uh, so, but I do, but here's the great thing. She's working on a second edition. <laughs> so I'm helping her with that, you know, and I type everything up in big print and take it to her and, and so on. But for her, she she can't quite anymore sit with a book and, and read it. She can't do that. So if she needed the bedtime story, you could read to her. I read, I read to her, yeah, yeah. So... Anyway, um, gee, I really want to thank the Frugal Frigate for inviting me to come to this and inviting all of you. And I also want to say that I have wonderful memories of, as do Barbara and Helen, of events at the Frugal Frigate. Um, over the years, I would always, I, would, I live up in Washington State now, but I would always come down there and... Um, and wonderful memories of the store and Catherine, of course, and the readers there were just wonderful people. So um, when I, I next remember, come down to California, I'd like to come see you. I would love that. And we can maybe go to lunch or something. Um, yeah, I, when I worked there in high school, you published Cosette in right. 1995. And we mm -hmm. had a book release for you there. And I, re I still remember that. I can picture the cover in my head. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was a good time. Um, all right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for coming. And Laura is going to bless us with a short reading now. I got a little piece here from the preface of Memory into Memoir. And it goes like this. Both memoir and fiction rely on imagination. Writing a memoir is not simply an act of preservation, but an act of invention because the fabric of the past is never clean, hemmed, pressed, folded, and stacked chronologically. The past comes to us in fragments, finished off by imagination. Indeed, memoir best flourishes at the confluence of memory and imagination. Memory calls on imagination to mend the ragged ends, to create continuity over the frayed parts. <clears throat> <clears throat> In transferring, transforming amorphous memory into a narrative memoir, the writer puts a literary structure over the past, hoping to both capture and evoke, one act propelling the other. This is the writing process, that is to say, the canopy concept over this book. Memory into memoir is less of an Ikea how to assemble manual and more of an invitation to reimagine the past in writing, to rethink revisit memory in prose. Memory into memoir explores the process of placing narrative form over the unruly past. Prose does not spring onto the, page, the printed page like Venus on the half shell. Writing is a process of growth and change and discovery. And as I learned all those years ago in grad school and still firmly believe, good writing is good writing no matter the form. Memoir writers can learn from fiction and fiction writers can profit from the memoir. The materials you will find in this book, though specific to the memoir, can be used by any writer. As I now read and reread, revise and rethink what I have seen, what I have written, I see that my own past plays a role here, making memory into memoir, also a personal memoir of sorts. I dedicated this book to my mother, Peggy Calpac in Johnson, and followed her process in these pages because it is illustrative for other writers. She wrote her memoir in her 90s and finished it when she was 97. Please consider this book an invitation 
to pick up the pen. Think of that pen as an oar as you get into your little narrative boat and paddle towards the past. So, so thank you everybody. And uh, those of you who are writers, good luck to you. Happy, I'm happy to see everybody that I already know and happy to see even the ones I don't. So uh, yes, yeah, so let's stay in touch, okay? Thank you, Erin, again for this lovely opportunity. Laura, thank you so, so much for your time today. This is truly wonderful. Thank you. Uh, All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for attending. Bye, Have a great everybody. rest thank of your you. day. Thank you. Bye-bye.